332. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me, and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the death do lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. All right, take your Bibles, if you would, and go to Esther, Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. Let me just say, as you're turning there in your Bibles, that uh, I wanted to encourage you to go to the government website, Engage Manitoba, and uh, they're asking for our input. And so I trust that you will give some input. Somebody said yesterday that they've been having trouble get on the web, getting on the website to uh, take the survey. Uh, but I think if you keep trying, uh, you will be able to get on there. I was able to get right on there. Of course, I did it late at night. But uh, also, I was telling the college yesterday uh, that you need to really read those questions carefully uh, because uh, it's a, it almost seems like uh, some of those questions you can't win for losing, so to speak, and which way you uh, answer that. But I trust you'll take your time, work your way through that. But then on uh, point number 13, they do have a little box there that you can uh, give in your own words your feelings about things. And let me encourage you to put your comments there. Just make sure that they're not rude or crude. Uh, make sure they're not antagonistic but let your feelings be known in regards to wanting to meet together as a church. We need to hear, it seems like they're hearing a lot from those that want to keep things clamped down. They need to hear from those of us who want to see the restrictions lifted. Of course, we're praying for that, and I trust as Brother Elias mentioned just a few moments ago that at noontime, uh, whether you're at home or at work, or maybe you can make your way here, we've been having the noontime prayer meetings and uh, we've been praying for an hour. If you can only give it 10 minutes, if you can only give it a, a half hour or whatever, uh, just make sure you spend some time, if you could, during that time, and just pray and ask the Lord to release the restrictions for us, as well as to give us revival. 
And so I trust that you'll make that a priority. I think if we're uh, really serious about things, this ought to drive us to prayer, ought to drive us to the Word of God. So it's one thing to talk about the restrictions. It's one thing to talk about how we wish things would be different. But there's only one person really that can make that big difference, and that is God himself. He has allowed this to take place. Maybe he's allowing this to take place just so that it would be a wake-up call to we believers. That if we don't stand for the cause of Christ and the things of Christ, then we may very well lose those freedoms that have been granted to us. And make no mistake, uh, God can work in the hearts and minds of those who do not know him as savior. I'm reminded of Abimelech in the Old Testament where he uh, was moved by God. God appeared to him and said, look, you restore uh, Isaac's wife to himself because if you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna die. <laughs> and, and so uh, the message came clear and he says, you know, I'll, I'll do that and he restored the wife. So let me encourage you to really make sure that you pray and uh, pray that God would move in our midst as well. Uh, in Esther chapter four, I wanna begin reading here in verse 13. I've entitled the message, Acting on God-Given Wisdom. Acting on God-Given Wisdom. And so as we read this passage of scripture, keep that thought in mind. The Bible says these words, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Chapter five, verse one. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now as we read this passage of scripture, as we continue on to verse eight, let me just once again reiterate the title of the message, acting on God-given wisdom. And it was so when the king saw, verse two, Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee, and what is thy, thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, my petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I have prepared for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Oh, how we need God's wisdom today. You know, that wisdom will guide us through life, especially for we believers. You know, a doctor gives news to a family that a serious physical condition has struck a family member. Maybe that would be you. Maybe that would be a loved one that you know. You go to the doctor and you seek treatments 
And you know, when you are told that you have a debilitating illness, you have all kinds of alternative treatments coming your way. People have pills that they want you to take, maybe a drink they want you to have. You go to a doctor and they'll say, well, we can try this or this or this. And you don't know what to do. I can remember years ago, someone coming to me and cancer had been diagnosed and they had all kinds of directions that they, should, they could have gone. And they said, Pastor, what should we do? That was a time that we went to James chapter one, verse five, that we'll read in just a moment. And I just said, what we need to do and you need to do is we need to pray. We need to seek God's face. This is a time where we look to the great physician. And so I encourage that family to take all the various things and do their research. Yes, do their homework. Ask God to guide them and then Whatever they choose under the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God, they need to accept it by faith. In other words, believing in the great physician to whatever treatment is chosen that he can heal if he wants. It could also be that God is choosing this way to take that loved one to himself. And that's not bad either. Of course, parting in this life is not easy. However, eternity is forever. And so shall we ever be with the Lord if we know him as Savior. But it's times like that, that we need God's wisdom. But not just the wisdom he gives us, we need to act upon that wisdom by faith. You know, the avenues, as I mentioned just a moment ago, for healing are really, <laughs> uh, they're, just, they're just a lot of them, right? And at the same time, you can ask God and God will guide you each step of the way. It could also be you're looking for a career change uh, and the opportunities seem to be boundless as to what you could find yourself doing or the flip side of that coin is the fact that uh, you can't find satisfaction in the job that you find yourself. You work and you're trying to try this, that or the other and you just don't seem to find fulfillment there. God can give you the wisdom, and once he gives you that wisdom, act upon that wisdom to find fulfillment with your life. You have a relationship problem. Trouble comes to your home or to you personally, and it seems like no resolution is in sight. Oh, and maybe you're living contentedly, and all of a sudden your world gets turned upside down. You need God's wisdom. You think about this passage of scripture with Esther. She's living what we would say at this particular time of the reading, a storied life. I mean, she's queen. She's reached the pinnacle of the kingdom. Now understand, the Jewish people have been in captivity. And yet at the same time as they're in captivity, she is ri rising in the ranks of the kingdom. And she ultimately finds herself as queen. Here's a young girl who's lost her mom and dad in death. She's been raised by a cousin, an older cousin, and here she finds herself being integrated into the kingdom where now the king says, Esther, whatever you want, you can have it. Up to half of the kingdom. You remember from past messages that that would take in from the southern tip of India and in Pakistan all the way up to Sudan, 127 provinces. This was a huge kingdom and she could have half of it if she requested it. So she was living a storied life, but Haman begins to work his dastardly deed because he hates the Jews. God's people have been a hated people. And you need to understand as we look at the children of Israel, they're not a picture of the local church, but they are a picture or type of a believer. And you need to understand that in this world, we are not gonna be liked. Uh, the, the, the Lord said that in, in John chapter 15. He says, if the world hated me, they're gonna hate you too. And all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we need to understand that principle uh, of life. 
And at the same time, we find her asking for wisdom. She's asking for Mordecai to spend three days along with the other Jews that would be found out and for three days to fast. And that means not to eat, not to drink, and just as the inference is, beg God for a solution. Beg, beg God for deliverance. Let's go now to James chapter one. James chapter one. And let me just say, if there's ever a time where she needs wisdom, she's in this spot. What does she do? How does she handle this situation? She knows the edict that's come down is the law of the Medes and Persians, which changes not. Now that Xerxes has signed this law, it cannot be retracted. And so she's in the spot now because it's gonna be found out ultimately, Mordecai said that she's a Jew. And so if all the Jews are to be killed, she's gonna be one of them. And so she needs the wisdom of God. So as we think of this account and we look at this account this morning, Let's not miss the important truth of it for our lives today. We need the wisdom of God, but not only the wisdom of God to know it, but we must also act upon it. And that's what we find her doing. And so as I have you turn to James chapter one, I wanna begin reading here with verse two. Now understand the general epistles are written mainly to a Jewish audience. And that's why when you get through with the Pauline epistles, those are the letters that the Apostle Paul penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, you get to these general epistles. These were written according to Acts chapter eight to the Jews of the persecution or what we would say today is the dispersal. And so he's writing these words to the local church, but to the Jews that have been scattered around because of persecution. And he says these words, my brethren. Now that's an important couple of words there. He's not just writing to just a general audience. He's not writing to the world. He's writing to believers. These are believers that are having a tough time. It says here, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now, you know, when I was growing up and I'd come across some of these words that says divers temptation, I said, what in the world does that have to do with water? I'm thinking divers, you know? And divers, as we don't use it that common today, it just means various temptations, uh, various trials, various happenings of life. So he's encompassing all the different scenarios that you may find yourself in. He says, divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now let's go back to verse two. It says here, when you fall into divers temptations, that word fall indicates, as I just mentioned, all the various happenings of life. It's not talking here about sin. He's just talking about living life. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where there's trouble. You can be doing everything right and then trouble will still come to your doorstep. And you and I need to understand that as believers. It's not God forsaking us. It's not God being mean to us. It is just living life in a sin cursed world. And that's why the Lord says, look, <clears throat> this world is not your home. You're just passing through. And we need to understand that ultimately, at the end of all, the battle of Gog and Magog, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, he's making a new heaven and a new earth. Praise his name. And so it talks about falling. I want us to understand that. Some people just think that when they fall, it's just because of sin. But we need to understand how the scriptures are indicating this in the book of James. Then it says patience here. It says, knowing this, verse three, that the trying, the testing of your faith, what, worketh patience. 
Patience means this. It means to persevere. It means to remain under, if you please. A lot of times when we think of praying when we're having a problem or a trouble or a trial, especially if you say have a sickness, I use that as an example only, and you want to be relieved of that right away. Say, Lord, how long, how long, how long, how long? And here the scripture says, patience is persevering or enduring or bearing up under the load. In other words, it could very well be that God is working a good molding work in your life as well as testifying of his grace to others through your life. A case in point is if you were to take your Bibles, we won't look at it this morning, but if you'd go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, those first 10 verses of scripture, you have the account of the apostle Paul and he's been given a thorn in the flesh. The Bible says a messenger of Satan. But you remember from Job that before anything comes to the life of a believer, it has to pass by the throne room of God first. So it has to pass by his eyes first. He has to give permission. And he says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. In that passage of scripture, Paul has been given a thorn in the flesh. There's been a lot of conjecture as to what that is. Some people believe it was eye trouble because of the writings and the indication he gives in the book of Galatians chapter six. I don't know what it is. God saw fit not to tell us. But at the same time, that thorn in the flesh, it says, buffeted him. It beat on him. It gave him trouble every day. Now, interesting, when we think of buffet, we just think maybe he got slapped around a little bit. That word buffet is a strong word. It means to beat upon. So this was not an easy thorn, an easy life, an easy malady and sickness or illness that Paul had in his life. This was serious business. It kept him dependent upon the Lord. You see, because he had been given some extra grace and he saw some things, he was caught up to the third heaven. It says, too wonderful for a man to utter. And to keep him from being lifted up with pride, God allowed this trouble to come into his life. You know, Paul, the great apostle, the church planter got down on his knees, I'm sure many a night. But the Bible says he prayed three times, God, take this away. God, take this away. God, take this away. And then God came to him and answered his prayer and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul understood that principle and we'll have to do the same, I'm sure, in our life. If God gives us years, all of us will exit this life one way or the other. And you see, we'll need that same grace. And when we are going through that circumstance, he'll give us that grace and Paul embraced that. And he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wow, what a statement. It's easy to read that passage of scripture. It's easy to think and meditate on that scripture. It's something else to live through that scripture, I'm sure. And so patience, it produces, the Bible here says, maturity. Look at verse four. But let patience have her perfect work. It says that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. When we think about wanting something, uh, we think about we're lacking something in our life. And so I want to have lunch after this, <laughs> you know? I, I want to do this, I want to go here, I, I want this, I want to raise, you know, this kind of stuff. 
That's not what wanting here in the context means. It means that as you bear up under the load, understanding the principle of Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, that he will give you that strength. He will help you through that. He will make sure that you don't lack a thing. Your needs will be met. Sometimes though, we are focusing so much on the situation. We're focusing so much on the trouble, the problem, that we fail to see the God through the problem, in the problem. The disciples did that. Peter did that on the Sea of Galilee. He's walking on the water and he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he's, he's hearing the wind and seeing the effects of the wind and the waves lapping up against the boat and here he is just walking on the water. And what happened is he started looking at the situation he was in instead of the savior of the situation. And many times we do the same thing. You go through trouble, you have the tendency to look at the situation, the trouble, rather than the Savior. And that's where we need to refocus. God has given us his wisdom. And that's what I see here if you look again at the passage of Scripture in verse 5. It says, if any of you lack wisdom. Look at that again. Verse 2 says, my brethren, and it means sisters too. And it says here, my brethren. And then he goes, if any of you lack wisdom, a wisdom is applied knowledge. You remember in Proverbs chapter one, I believe it's verse seven, I believe it's one of the key verses of Proverbs. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so everything starts with God. And so here we have a respect for our God and what he's given us in his word because it's his word. These are the facts. And then he comes to us in chapter nine and verse 10. And it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it says, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so when you think about God, he gives us the knowledge, that's his word. We have the mind of Christ. So here it is. But now we need wisdom from him to know how to live the word of God. In other words, it's not enough just to read the words. As you know, I used to work at a prison and when I would work at this prison, I remember one guy by the last name of Barham. He, I don't know, I remember right off the top of my mind here what he was in for, but he was doing a number of years he was uh, a young man, but he could stand there and quote scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. He had the knowledge, but he didn't have the wisdom. And the Bible here says that it's not enough in essence, bringing it to today, to go to Sunday school and church, to have your devotions, to memorize scripture. It's not enough to just have the word of God up here. You need to apply the word of God. When you think of Esther and here she's been fasting and praying, you begin to see how she is working out her plan because God's given her wisdom. She goes in, it's really, really fascinating. She goes before the king, he extends the scepter, she goes in his presence, throws a banquet for the king and Haman. And yet she still doesn't tell them what she wants. She sets up another banquet. She's not acting like many of us. Oh, you know, she's been given the word that, hey, you're gonna get killed, Esther, if this does not change, if something doesn't happen, if you don't intervene for your people, you're gonna be killed. You think she'd be a basket case. You think she'd be all upset. You think she'd go in there and just cry before the king and beg him for life or the Jewish people, but she doesn't do that. You see, she asked Mordecai, she asked her maidens, and she herself 
fasted and prayed, and then went into the kingdom and acted upon a particular plan of action that I believe that God gave her as we see the providence of God, God's hand resting on this situation in these 10 chapters. What a mighty God we serve. And he'll give you and me that same kind of wisdom. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. In other words, you pray and you ask God. Now, when the Bible talks about praying, he's not talking about vain repetitions. You can't just come flippantly before the throne of grace and say, God, I have this need. And it's not like you sit there and you teach your children when they're very young, the pray for the food. Pray when you go to bed and you have these rote prayers, you know, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. That's great to start a little child with, but yet you need to graduate from that. You need to, what this indicates is if you have a situation, like I talked about at the beginning of the message, that is so dire and, and you're in such need that you go before him and you ask him, God, I need to know what to do. God says, let him ask in faith. He says that right here, he says, but let him ask in faith, verse three, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. In other words, you either believe that he can answer you and that God has the answer for you or you don't. We're quick as Bible believers in the matter of salvation to say it's faith in Jesus Christ and him alone without works. That's the truth of salvation. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us, amen? And so we see that, but we need to understand, we say that to be saved, you must trust only in Jesus Christ, that's true. But somehow, something happens to us after we get saved. We think now we'll go through the problems of life and not only do we have to pray and get God's input on it, we have to mix our own input with it. So in other words, we need him only for salvation, but yet when we live life, we don't really need him anymore. Or, you know, I, I just need as I go and see this counselor or this counselor, I read this book or read this book or I Google this or Google that, uh, I'll find out what he has to say too and I'll just see how it all figures out. Folks, there's never a time in our life where we can be independent of God. We must have him first. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. We don't have to figure it all out. He has got life all figured out for us. And if he can save our wretched souls, he can take care of the every other daily incidences that may come into our lives. Amen. Faith means believing. It means to be fully persuaded. In other words, you either believe God or you don't. Let's think about this. I'll, I'll just read to you what I, I uh, read, read here in my notes. Esther begged Mordecai to fast and pray for her. The indication is that she believed. Listen to this next statement. Believing does not necessarily mean that things will go your way. Believing means that you believe things will go God's way. I'm gonna read those last two sentences. Believing does not necessarily mean that things will go your way. Believing means 
that you believe things will go God's way. Remember she said, if I perish, I perish. I'm gonna go into the presence of the king. I'm gonna act upon what I believe he's given me to do. And if I perish, I perish. I'm reminded of some things. I'm reminded of Mark chapter six with John the Baptist. He took a principal biblical stand to the leader of the kingdom and he says, look, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And ultimately, the will of God was for John the Baptist to eventually lose his head. You remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What happened with him? He prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He prayed again. He prayed again. And then he went to the cross. He said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I'm also reminded of the Hebrew children. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. It's interesting that they refused to bow down to the king. See, bowing to those men was actually an act of worship. You were actually giving them godlike status in your life. They looked, people looked at them as gods. And, and yet these three young Jewish boys said, uh-uh, we only bow to one. And that's the God of heaven. We are not gonna bow to you. And it's interesting, the threat came to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And I love their answer. Their answer was so critical here. He said, they said, King, our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to you. Wow. We're not going to bow down to you. And you know, they got thrown into the furnace. But there's a fourth man, the king said, didn't we just throw three men in there? They said, yeah, king. Okay. But I see a fourth, <laughs> like unto the Son of God. And the truth of that passage is that you and I, we keep our allegiance to God. We follow God. We act upon the Word of God. The wisdom He gives us, we live it out. We do it. We fulfill it. And then we leave the results up to Him. He's able to deliver you through all of your problems, all your trials, all the situations of life. But if not, don't you bow to the gods of this world. If He doesn't deliver you, if you have to go through sickness, if you have to live through sickness, if God takes you in death, if you lose your job, things don't go as you planned that they go, don't bow to the gods of this world. Keep your eyes not on the waves, not on the effects of the wind. Keep your eyes on the God of heaven. Don't bow. Esther had that same kind of thought here. And you notice, she prayed, she fasted. The people of Israel, Mordecai and others fasted for three days. God gave her wisdom. And we'll see as we travel through these 10 chapters, just how God unfolds it and makes it work out to his honor and his glory. What a help for us today. Let me just say a few things in closing. When you pray for wisdom, then act upon it. When you pray for wisdom, act upon it. I like the old saying I heard years ago, don't undo in doubt what you did in faith. Don't undo in doubt what you did in faith. So when you pray for wisdom, act on it. Number two, Esther was kind and yet deliberate in her follow through. 
She was not rude or demanding. When you go through into situations of life, this is where the liberals have us beat as Christians. They're satisfied with little incremental victories along the way. With us, we think it's all or nothing. Got to have it right now. And that's why we have liquor and Winkler today. Because we say, I had to have it all right now. It's no, no, no. And yet what happened is these liberals, little by little, they just got their foot in the door. And then, you know, somebody says, you give the devil an inch and he takes a foot. You give him a foot, he takes a yard. And on and on it goes. And we Christians, we need to understand, we need to start acting with wisdom. We need to ask God what to do and how to go about doing it. And then we need to incrementally move forward for the cause of Christ. Many times, how do you win somebody to Jesus? At first, it may not, they may not be open, but little by little, you try to keep the door open and talk to them and give them things to listen to and things to think on and so on. And pretty soon the Bible talks about his words like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You don't break the rock with one blow. It's little by little by little by little by little by little. And you and I, we can't lose sight of the goal. We need to keep going in that direction. Number three, when working through issues, keep the end in view. And number four, when you have the opportunity, pray, believe, meditate, think things through, but then do it, do it, follow through. Use the wisdom that God has given you. Don't just know it up here. Don't just quote it through your mouth. Put it in everyday shoe leather. Work it out to the glory of God. That's where the difference of the Christian life is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray much that you would help us to get the truth of this message. Boy, Lord, what an illustration of God-given wisdom through the life of Esther. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, every single one of us will need the truth of this message today. Thank you for giving us the knowledge. Thank you for giving us wisdom. You are the very spirit of wisdom, Isaiah 11, 1. But Lord, I pray you'd help us not just to know what to do with the wisdom or knowledge you've given us, but I pray you'd help us to live it out, to flesh it out 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, year after year, I pray. While your heads are bowed, let me encourage you to talk to God about what you've just heard. You may be going through some dire circumstances, what we would call and refer to as valleys in life, some problems maybe no one even knows about in our congregation. Maybe it's just you and the circumstance. Let me encourage you. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He'll help you. He'll give you the answer and work it out. Live it out. Put it into practice to his honor and glory. It could be that this morning you've been listening to the message and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. When I was reading this passage of scripture from James chapter one and verse two, those first two words ought to have caught your attention where it says, my brethren. You know, people say, pastor, you, you always mention salvation in your message. Dio Moody was preaching in England years ago and he began his campaign and he preached on, you must be born again. And he did that the first night, preached the same message the second night, preached the same message the third night. The account says that he preached many nights the same message. And somebody came up to him and say, why do you keep preaching on, you must be born again? And his answer, no surprise, was 
because ye must be born again. That's the foundation of life, folks. And so you can read all the books, you can get all the counsel, you can go to all the church services you want, but if you don't have the foundation of Jesus Christ laid in your life, it won't matter. You need Christ. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, let me encourage you to ask God to forgive you of your sin. It's what we call repentance. You change your mind about your life, your sin, your way of going to heaven, and you believe in what Jesus Christ has said in his word. In the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, is the death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures. And you need to put your faith and trust in him and him alone, Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. And you need to put your faith, your trust, believing, being fully persuaded that he's your only hope of eternal life. And that you ask him to forgive you of your sin and come into your heart and save you. And the Bible says, you shall be saved. And if you still have some doubts, there's some questions, I know I just barely touched on this this morning here at this invitation time. Please contact us, let us help you. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And then Christian, the second one of course, is what will you have me to do, Lord? Dear Heavenly Father, as we conclude this service with our next song, Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply this message to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you folks.